ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما The last time I spoke to you I spoke about intellectual stagnation concerning fiqh the four schools of Islamic law Today I'd like to continue that subject by dealing with intellectual stagnation that has gripped us in the field of hadith studies Now I know the discussion has already begun because I broached my views to some of the sheikh and uh, that has stimulated some discussion already I don't mind differing views because if you recall from what I said previously my highway of Islam is very broad so it's not my way or the highway if you have a different view it just might be possible that you have another lane which is also on my highway so it's not my way or the highway but your way is also on my highway now there are two general views concerning our approach to Islam one view is that you should uh, use reason as minimal as possible only when it becomes necessary and that should be absolutely subjected to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam another view is that you should have unbridled use of reason so that you judge the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam according to your reason what your reason accepts you accept and what your reason rejects you reject now most muslims would think that there is no scholarly support for this second view and that's true so we should stick with the first one where we should use reason where necessary and we subject that to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam however when it comes to hadith studies we should be aware that today what is represented as a hadith or a saying of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not said to you directly from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to you You might be reading it in one of the six books of hadith even if you read it in Bukhari which is the most authentic of all the hadith books you're not getting it straight from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you should be aware of that you're getting it from Bukhari rahimahullah who got it from A who got it from B who got it from C who got it from D who got it from E who got it from F who said that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said such and such so now if the such and such is contrary to reason many of the scholars have said in the past that such a hadith is suspect instead of thinking that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said something which does not make sense you should rather think that one of the narrators along the way from a to f may have made a mistake in what they heard or what they remembered and so in what they transmitted let us not think you I have with me here a book uh, Al Hadith a collection of four volumes of hadith translated by Maulana Fazlul Karim may Allah have mercy on him and he tells us a number of criteria based on which the scholars in the past rejected hadith now there are two basic areas in which these criteria fall one general area is the criteria for testing the authority of each individual from A to F to be know these people and so on now I won't go into that because that is still being done by our scholars we don't have intellectual stagnation there it is still being done but where we have the intellectual stagnation is on the other category judging the report for its reasonableness in other words taking the content of that hadith what is reported concerning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and seeing if that really gels with reason with understanding with history with geography with science Now let me just read out for you one by one what he says. A. It must have been plainly mentioned that such and such a thing was said or done by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. B. The narrator must have stated that he was present or he heard a tradition uttered by the Prophet 
or in the case of his being removed by distance of time and place, he must have given complete chain of narrators from the last link up to the Prophet ﷺ. C. A, had a tradition, that is a hadith, leveling an accusation against a companion of the Prophet or against the Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet's household was rejected. D. A tradition having a non-Arabic style and ignoble sense of words used was rejected. E. It must have been proved that he did actually meet each one of the chain of narrators from which he derived his information. F. It must have been proved that each of the narrators at the time he heard the tradition narrated was of an age at which he was to understand the full import of what he had narrated, of what he had heard, sorry. G. The report of tradition which was inconsistent with established historical fact was rejected. H. The description of a tradition sanctioning a very severe punishment for slightest fault or prom promising a high reward for a very small virtue was counted as one of the causes of rejection. I. Each one of the narrators from the last person up to the Prophet wasallam, must have been a person of conspicuous, a person conspicuous for his piety, virtue and honesty. J. Each one of the narrators must have been conspicuous for his learning so that he might be safely presumed to be competent both to understand correctly and deliver faithfully to others what he heard. K. If a reporter narrated a tradition which ought to have been known and acted upon by the Muslims generally but was unknown and the reporter was alone in narrating it, it was discarded. L. A tradition contrary to reason or known principle of law was rejected. M. A tradition which was contradictory to the teachings of the Qur'an was a ground for rejection. And N. A tradition contradicting the universally accepted sayings of the Prophet ﷺ was rejected. So these are all grounds from A to N for rejecting a hadith not because of who said it, but because of what the hadith actually says. You look at it and you say, well, this doesn't make sense. Do you really think the Prophet ﷺ said that? Well, let's examine that. Now, of course, we can't leave that up to every Tom, Dick and Harry to judge the narrators for themselves or to judge the narrations for themselves. Most of us do not have that kind of scholarly competence. But to say that our scholars shouldn't be able to do that is to bring us again into the grips of intellectual stagnation. Now what is generally now thought among Muslims is that the hadiths which are in Sahih Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim have been tested so thoroughly and have been graded to be Sahih which means authentic by so many scholars throughout history that now to make any revision of Sahih Muslim or Sahih Bukhari is sacrilege. You can't do that, they say. Why? Because so many scholars in the past said that this is true. But scholars in the past or in the future and the present can all be wrong all at the same time. Even if we do any revision, we can also be wrong. But that is just the chance that we have to take. We cannot just simply depend on what people have said before us. Because many of the people before us could not have imagined some of the things that we are experiencing. Do you think in the past people could have imagined that people would clone sheep in our present age? But it is happening. So, we cannot say that just because somebody in the past said it, that's true. If the Prophet ﷺ said it, and it is sure that he said it, that's a different matter. But we don't have that in Bukhari and Muslim. On the other hand, if we were to read Bukhari and Muslim, what we actually find is that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, who lived with him and knew him better than we do, refused reports just because of what the reports say. Not because of who is saying it. They trust the people who are saying it. They are their fellow companions. Other companions of the Prophet ﷺ saying, the Prophet ﷺ said something, and some companions are saying, well, he couldn't have said that. Let me give you some examples. I took some notes from Bukhari and Muslim. We have a report in uh, Sahih Muslim in volume 1, page 371 in the Arabic English edition from Mahmud bin Rabia. 
This is that companion of the Prophet ﷺ who knew this Prophet ﷺ when he, this companion, was only a young boy. And he affectionately remembers how the Prophet ﷺ playfully sprayed his face with water when they met on one occasion. Now this man reports that on, a, on an occasion, the Prophet ﷺ heard people criticizing one of the Muslims saying that man is a hypocrite and the Prophet ﷺ said no he's not a hypocrite don't you know that he loves Allah and his messenger so don't say things like that about him but the people couldn't buy this and they kept insisting messenger of Allah we, we only see him befriending the Jews they, they want the Prophet ﷺ to say that he's a hypocrite but the Prophet ﷺ said whoever says la ilaha illallah Jannah is secure for him or something to this effect now, this Mahmoud bin Rabia went eventually and related this to a group of people among whom was Abu Ayyub al-Ansari May Allah be pleased with him, one of the companions of the Prophet And what did Abu Ayyub al-Ansari say? I don't think the Prophet said that, what you're saying So this companion Mahmoud bin Rabia said to himself When I go back and I meet the man who informed me of this I'm going to be sure to ask him about it so the report continues that eventually when he went and he met that man, he asked him about it and that man confirmed to him, yes, uh, that's true, that's what I told you before. But as far as Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is concerned in this report, the last we see of him is when he said, I don't think the Prophet wasallam said what you said. So it's done. In other words, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari thought that the contents of this report should not be trusted. It doesn't make sense that this man, who was known for what he was, that he is definitely going into paradise. Now I'm not saying that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was right or wrong. But I'm just showing you their attitude towards the narration. If the narration itself didn't make sense, they just re rejected it. There's another interesting report, and, and the force of the argument builds here. From Sayyid Muslim, in uh, volume 2, pages 49 and 52 the report says that Umar radiallahu anh, when he was stabbed was visited by somebody who started to weep and Umar radiallahu anh, said uh, you know why are you weeping the Prophet sallallahu said that the people in the graves are punished because of the weeping of their relatives so Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh heard this and Ibn Umar radiallahu anh heard this, the son of Umar and later on Ibn Abbas went to Aisha radiallahu anha after the death of Umar and she, he asked her about it so Aisha radiallahu anha said, may Allah have mercy on Umar and she denied that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said what Umar said she said instead Hasbukum al Quran. Hasbukum al Quran. The Quran is sufficient for you. And then she quoted from the Quran, La Taziru wa Ziratun Wizra Ukra. Now I'm not mentioning this to settle the issue as to whether the dead are punished for the weeping of the live ones. I'm, I'm not trying to settle that issue with you. I'm proving one thing and one thing only. That the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, when they heard a report that did not make sense, or in this case that seems to contradict a clear teaching in the Quran they just simply rejected it and this is what Aisha radiallahu anh had did now Ibn Umar radiallahu anh the son of Umar still had the same information which he got from his father so he kept repeating to people that the dead are punished because of the weeping of the live ones so then this goes back to Aisha radiallahu anh again and what does she say? may Allah forgive Ibn Umar you know, either he forgot or he has made a mistake. So just because a companion of the Prophet ﷺ said that the Prophet said something, it doesn't mean that he is accurate in what he reports. He is a human being like the rest of us. Sometimes they forget and sometimes they can make mistakes. Or well, that information is also found in Sahih al-Bukhari in volume 2, page number 210. Now, 
there is a third uh, incident I'd like to report to you. A hadith reported by Abu Huraira radiallahu an about what breaks the prayer. You know there is the idea that when you pray you should have a sutra before you, something that marks off your prayer space. If you don't and somebody passes in front of you, then that will break your prayer according to some scholars. Now I don't want to settle that issue of what is the fit on this question. But I just want to deal with the one thing and one thing only as to how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ reacted to reports. Now, according to Sahih Muslim, Sahih Muslim volume 1, page 298, Abu Huraira anh, said that the Prophet ﷺ said that three things disrupt the prayer. That is three things that pass in front of you, yakta us salah will break the prayer. A woman, a dog, or a donkey. So now this report goes around and it comes to Aisha radiallahu anha. And according to Sahih al-Bukhari in volume 1 page 292, when Aisha radiallahu anha heard this, she said, you're comparing us to dogs and donkeys? I used to be in front of the Prophet wasallam in the house and he would be praying. And then she goes on to relate how when the Prophet ﷺ wanted to make sujood, she would pull her legs and he would make sujood because they had very cramped quarters, you see. And then when she wanted to leave, she would just slip out by the side and move. So according to her, from her experience, a woman passing in front of the prayer in person does not break the prayer. Now I'm not trying again to settle the issue whether it does or doesn't break the prayer, but look at how she regards the narration which comes to her. It doesn't make sense. She thinks the Prophet ﷺ could not have said that. Alright, a fourth and last example. I know it's raining and uh, I want you to uh, be out of here soon. In Sahih Muslim, in volume 4, on page 386, there is an interesting narration about the origin of rats. How did rats come about? Abu Huraira radiallahu anh said, that the Prophet ﷺ said, and now there are two reports there, so I'll conflate them to give you the gist of both. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said that rats originated, he thinks, in this way. That there were a group of Bani Israel who became lost, and it's not known what happened to them. But I think that they were transformed into rats. And a sign of this is as follows. Before I go to the sign, you should be aware that uh, according to Jewish law, camels' meat and camels' milk are prohibited. So they won't eat the meat or drink the milk of camels. But they will drink the milk and eat the meat of goats. So the hadith continues that the sign that the Bani Israel were transformed into rats is that if you put goat's milk in front of rats, they will drink from it. But if you put camel's milk in front of rats, they will not drink from it. Now, I'm not trying to settle whether the Prophet ﷺ said this or not, not at the moment. But how is this report now to be regarded? Abu Huraira radiallahu an reported this to Kaab, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And Kaab says to him, Did the Prophet, did you hear the Prophet? Asamiyatahu. Min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did you hear this from the Prophet? He said, yes, I heard it. And the report says that Kaab kept asking him miraran, again and again. Did you hear this from the Prophet? Until Abu Huraira said, am I reading the Torah? In other words, yes, I did hear it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why are you doubting me? But Kaab is doubting because of what the text actually says. So, in summary then, these reports from Bukhari and Muslim show that if you say that Bukhari and Muslim are sahih, they are correct, when you go to them, you actually find the reports there showing you that the right way to deal with hadith is that if they do not make sense, you do not have to accept them. Because the best of the generation of Muslims, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, reacted to hadith in this way. If it did not make sense to them, they said, 
we reserve judgment on that. Sometimes we deny the information. They said the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that, as in the case of Aisha radiallahu anha. What we need to do in modern times is this. We are coming through a long period of Islamic history with many vicissitudes along the way. And some time in Islamic history that I don't want to give you the specifics of now, it came to be decided among Muslims that using reason in religion is only going to corrupt this religion. So we must absolutely minimize the use of reason. So whereas previously the Muslim scholars used to judge hadith based on two things. The narrators who said it and the text of the hadith, what exactly is being said. In later times people did not want anymore to use their reasoning to judge what is being said but they wanted to only try to scrutinize the narrators. Because to scrutinize the narrators, again, we just rely on those who said something in the past. So that's easy. For one who says, I'm not going to use my brain, it's easy. You just go to the books of the past and they tell you that this narrator was good, accept his hadith, that narrator was not good, don't take his hadith. That's a simple job. But to use reason now means that we have to go to the text of Bukhari and Muslim, not every Tom, Dick and Harry, of course, but don't tell me the scholars cannot do this. I think the scholars can and they must. They must now go to Bukhari and Muslim, scrutinize it thoroughly once again, and find out which are the hadith that are sahih and which are not sahih. The present state of affairs is that you have Muslims on two sides of a wide spectrum. Some Muslims thinking all of the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim are sahih, you must accept them. Some other Muslims think hadith are just nonsense. We won't accept hadith, we just go by the Quran alone. I think that both groups are mistaken. And I think the proper way today to use hadith is that first we must start with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is sure and that is dependable. We learn from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything we can about what Islam is without confusing that understanding with anything else. And then we supplement that understanding with information that is there from the hadith. That information in the hadith which is compatible with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be accepted as explanations of the book of Allah. But those hadith which are in tension with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should in no wise be accepted. What is happening in today's uh, Muslim scholarship is that they take the hadith and if there seems to be a tension between a Quranic to a tension way that it should be done because of the very problem of hadith today as we can notice. Now, in Islamic history, there have always been scholars who have looked at hadith and they have said, okay, there's a little problem that, with that one, there's a little problem with that one, but then they pass over the rest as though nothing really changes. So, this kind of sporadic noticing of a problem here and a problem there, that's a patchwork way of doing the job. What we need to do is to go through a systematic approach. There is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, which tells us that Adam alayhi salam was 60 cubits long. Now, a cubit is, you know, a virat, an arm's length. That's about 90 feet. Adam alayhi salam was 90 feet tall. And that human beings diminished in height over time. Now I won't tell you whether I think that this hadith is true or false. But Ibn Hajar, the commentator on Sahih al-Bukhari, in his book Fat al-Bari, has already pointed out that this hadith is not believable. Based on archaeological and historical finds. But such a patchwork, just single, singling out one or two, is not going to do the job. You have to take a more systematic approach. I'll leave you with one last posing of a problem for you. If today we give people Bukhari and Muslim and you say, this is you know, what you must believe, otherwise you're not... Now, let me give you a specific example. I have with me here Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 6 in the Arabic-English edition. There is a hadith here which explains an ayah of the Qur'an. In Surah Yaseen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 36, that is, in ayah number 38, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِيلُ مُسْتَقَرِّ اللَّهَ In ayah number 40, Allah says, وَكُلُّنْ فِي فَلَكِي يَسْبَحُونَ Now, in modern times, we have no difficulty with these verses. Christians have difficulty with their Bibles, but we do not have with our Qur'an. Today we know that uh, the Milky Way galaxy, if that's the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, it's a spiral shape, it's not, it's not a flat book shape, but it's in a spiral shape. But if that's the Milky Way galaxy, our sun is about in one corner. And the earth is going around the sun. But the sun is also going around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The sun also 
has its phallus. Now, the entire galaxy is moving towards some point called the solar apex. So, the sun is also Tajri Lemustakharul Laha. It is going to its sixth place. So, no problem in the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a modern scientific point of view. But then, you go to Sahih al Bukhari and there is a hadith here which explains that verse. What is meant by Ashamsa Tajri Lemustakharul Laha? So in typical fashion, Bukhari says that I got it from this, who got it from that, who got it from the other one, who said that he heard the other one say, and who said that the Prophet ﷺ eventually does this. And here is what the Prophet ﷺ explains. That the sun actually, well to cut a long story short, from the explanation we gather, that the sun is making a daily journey around the earth. Which from today's point of view we know to, to be unacceptable. So they would think the Prophet ﷺ couldn't have said that, there must have been some mistake along the way. Now, a footnote in this translation, which is prepared in our present century, has this amazing statement. It says, And in our limited knowledge of geography, it is well known that the sun is going round the earth. I think he must have meant to say the opposite. Unless there's some kind of typographical error here, because we all learn the same geography, and in no geography do we learn that the sun is going around the earth. But this translator wanted to stick so closely, that's the hadith, we couldn't deviate from that, that he even fixed his own memory of what he learned in geography to agree with the, with the hadith. I must respect his piety, but at the same time we cannot recommend a, a hadith like that for people in modern times to believe. If he gives them that, they're going to say, no, I don't believe it, so what do you do? So I'm saying that it is very essential that the Muslim scholars of the present time should get out of this intellectual stagnation and they should put before the public what exactly are the hadiths that should be believed and which ones are not so dependable. Otherwise, if you say to people, take it or leave it, some people will just simply leave it. Another problem, which is more important and more pressing for me. If you give them the Qur'an and it says, الشَّمْسُ تَجْرِيلُ مُسْتَقَرُ لَهَا They have no problem. If you give them the Qur'an and it says, وَكُلُّنْ فِي فَلَكِ يَسْبَحُونَ They have no problem, as Dr. Maurice Bouquet has already amply demonstrated in his book, The Bible of Qur'an and Science. But then, if you give them Sahih al-Bukhari and you tell them, look, this is the explanation for that Quranic verse, then they will say, if this is true, then the Quran is wrong. You see the problem, brother? You know, people will, will protest and say, no, we can't use reason, but we absolutely must use it, otherwise we are misrepresenting the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and blocking people from entering this religion. الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا ما يهدي الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم I want to just close this khutbah then by giving you finally a summary of how hadith should be treated and this summary is found in hadith literature its origin, development, and special features by Muhammad Zubair Siddiqui, published by the Islamic Text Society. On page 114, he lists some of the criteria that Muslim scholars in the past have used uh, to judge the hadith for its reasonableness uh, in its content. And he tells us, here, here are the, uh, the ways. A. A tradition must not be contrary to the other traditions which have already been accepted by the authorities on the subject as authentic and reliable nor should it contradict the text of the Qur'an, a Matawatir hadith, the absolute consensus of the community, or the accepted basic principles of Islam. So if a hadith contradicts the Qur'an or any one of these other things, we must uh, reject that. B. A tradition should not be against the dictates of reason, the laws of nature, or common experience. C. Uh, traditions establishing a disproportionately high reward for insignificant good deeds, or disproportionately severe punishment for ordinary sins, must be rejected. D. Traditions describing the excellent properties of certain sections of the Qur'an may not be authentic. And the reason for that, if I add a footnote, is because people actually invented things. They said, okay, you read this surah and you get so much blessings. Because they want to encourage you, for good reason, you also invented hadith. Alright, E. Traditions mentioning the superior virtues of persons, tribes, and particular places should be generally rejected. F. Traditions which contain detailed prophecies of future events equipped with dates should be rejected. G. 
traditions t- containing such remarks of the Prophet wasallam as may not be a part of his prophetic vocation or such expressions as are clearly unsuitable for him should be rejected. And finally, H, a mutton, a text, should not violate the basic rules of Arabic uh, grammar and style. Otherwise, that too should be rejected. So then, finally, in sum, brothers and sisters, instead of taking all of the hadith wholesale and say this, once it's sahih, is definitely from the Prophet ﷺ, or instead of going to the other extreme of rejecting all of the hadith together and say we'll go with the Qur'an alone, we should go to the middle ground, which is the way that Muslims go ahead in their procedure in a balanced way, taking the good from both positions. And the good from both positions is to start with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember what Aisha radiallahu anha said, Hasbukum Allah. You start with that. That is enough for you. And use the hadith as a supplement to the Quran to explain further what the Quran is saying. Because you could not just simply proceed with the Quran alone. But you must supplement that with the hadith from the Prophet wasallam, where that is necessary, where it elucidates, where it explains, but not where it contradicts the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the guidance to always do what is right. And again, I uh, point out that I'm aware that, uh, you know, other views exist in the Muslim community, and I'm open to other views. What I've said today is refutable if someone can bring the evidence against it. Now, I'm sure that my view will be condemned, but refuted, I'm not so sure. But if anyone has the evidence to refute what I've said, I'd be very glad to hear that. And this member is open to anyone who has such a view and would like to come and present that for the Ummah. I believe that in the highway of Islam there are many lanes. And it's just possible that I have one view, I'm on one lane, and maybe somebody else is on on another lane. It's not my way or the highway, but that my highway includes your lane as well. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and forgive all of the Muslims and Muslims. اللهم اغفر لنا ولاخواننا الذين صرفونا بالايمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين امنوا ربنا انك رؤوف رحيم اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم والاموات انك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم اغفر له وارحمه وسكنه في الجنه بارك رحمكم الله ان الله يأمر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغض يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون